Hey, cool kids. <laughs> Welcome back to Eat Motel Podcast. And we are a replete set of humans today. Uh, Sam's here. Almost. I've got some skin I left on and some gravel earlier. Yeah. Not not in a macho way, but it sounds macho, but not in a macho. So you fell you fell off your bicycle. Did you squeal? Uh I think I went, ooh fuck. <laughs> I think in these times I'm sometimes quite surprised that I either go manly and go <gasps> or like <laughs> squeal in a very high pitched way. <laughs> well, maybe not. Right. Well, concussion. It's hard, it's hard to be that manly when you're in Lycra. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. This is this is a music. Uh, this is a music podcast. I promise. And our theme today. Do you want to share today's theme, Sam? Today we're talking about ska punk. <laughs> ska punk. Uh, ska punk, uh, which is a music uh, both loved and hated. But it's also because it's still summer. Well, it's almost summer still uh, here in Finland. But because it's still summer, and we've been doing a lot of metal stuff recently, we thought it might be fun to sort of go down ska punk lane because the punk is uh to me associated with uh, summer music really. see i'd never really never really thought about that but yeah ska is it's quite up it's quite kind of cheerful so if we had what what would like deep up, winter up, up. music be uh i'm oh, asking almost, you because you live in finland <laughs> yeah maybe something that sounds you know maybe some really brooding, like uh, Rachmaninoff or something like that. Some romantic, brooding, dark sort of stuff. Um, I'm just, I like that you added romantic. It's it's uh, well romantic as in romantic movement rather than romantic as in um, you want to fornicate. The nuance of fornication, did you say? <laughs> More romantic, as in there's a the artistic movement of romanticism rather than the um, the fornication movement of romanticism. <laughs> the romantic. Fornication, wow, what a great word. Anyway, let's start with the riff of the starting week. Well, starting well, starting well. Starting well, that we've done two minutes, two and a half minutes, and we're not really got into the music yet. So let's start with your riff of the week, which I'd like you to introduce because the the title, have you got it written down? Do you want me to say it? Uh, I'm finding I can't remember what the first guy's called. Okay, well the the title is S L W C C What, and the track is Be the Bones. So S L W, what? Who's that? Because it's a <laughs> bloody weird title, and I didn't think I'd be able to find it, but I did. S L W is Sam Lock Ward, and What C uh, is uh, Mike Watt, the legendary hey. bassist. Who... We just want to have a little cheer when we hear Mike Watt's name. Yeah, uh, he Minutemen and his own stuff, and the Latter Day Stooges, um, and he is a lovely, lovely man, um, and he always has time for everybody, and he's really, he's like, he's what you, they say, don't meet your heroes, meet Mike Watt. He's cool. <laughs> Excellent. Right, let's have a bit of Be the Bones. <laughs> I was quite surprised that was your choice. I wouldn't wouldn't place you as that type of music at all. That sort of almost Liverpool beat pop. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the Beatles certainly stick out in a frame of reference in that for me. Um, I know what you mean, uh, but I love a bit of the Beatles, and um, I really like the vocals on that. I really like quite... the, the hook. It'd be the bones. I really like the hook, um, and I think it's a really nice, chilled out piece of music. And I really, think it's really nice piece of pop. Well, considering we're we're kind of uh, dubbing this as our summer our summer celebration episode, I think that was quite a nice summery little uh, track. Where are you so... going? Well, I'm going uh, kind of the opposite direction, really. <laughs> Although I think it's joyous as fuck, but. This is a band called Burst. 
Now, oh, yeah. Sam and I saw Burst. Never heard of them, but we saw them at Hell Sinky. See, I'm starting to call it Hell Sinky to emphasise the two L's in it, which is a festival in Finland we reviewed a few episodes ago. And if you haven't heard that episode, go listen to it. But Burst just really impressed us. So this is a riff from a song called Slave Emotion. <laughs> Some riffs just make me so excited and so pleased and just want to punch a, a burrito or something. I don't know. I'm trying to think <laughs> of something you could punch that would have no aggression at all. But that riff, that completely just caught me like a, a haddock to the side of the head when I first heard that track. Because it's, what uh, is it? It's, what is, I can't even figure out what, how they're playing it. It's so strange, but so bloody brilliant. I think it, well, it sounds to me like a thrash riff, but it's all about, to me, it's like the propulsion of the drums is like, there's this endless sort of like, it's just moving forward. It's like a fucking locomo- mo- locomotive in that aspect. And you're waiting for it, the drummer to sort of, and the guitars to pull back and then give this big riff. And I don't, I haven't listened to that song because I, 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 frankly, uh, I went out and bought the vinyl and waited for it in the post and I refusing to listen to it mm-hmm. physically. And because um, you know, I, that's that's just something I want to do at the moment. And um, it's you're just and this, but this was the thing that hit me about Burst is that they sort of get you into this thing, and you're going. And if you're reading the music like you normally do, you're going to go, okay, that's going to build into like this really big uh, sort of big open epic chorus. And I'm not sure if it ever does because what they were so good at live is sort of going, this is what, this is a riff and you sort of understand the music of that riff, but it's not, it's where it ends up is not where you expected it to go. So it just, it ticks so many boxes for what I like about, um, I don't know if I can call that experimental music or not. I suppose you can, because it isn't verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, double chorus end. So yeah. when we saw them live, we were constantly just go, Whoa, didn't see that coming, but it all makes yeah. sense. I mean, you can just, <laughs> some of the music I've made, I, I had a review that said you never quite know where the music's going to go, and there are interesting things that get dropped into it. That's just because I'm shit at composing. <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not a deliberate thing. Um, but that, yeah, there you go, burst. But let's move on to some scar because I think, I think I'd quite like to do an interview with Burst actually. I wonder if they'd be up for it because they're Swedish, aren't they? But yeah. well, at least the, the singer certainly. No, speaks they're English. all Swedes, I think. All They're Swedes. all Swedes, but well, we well, we we heard the singer speak English um, yeah, on Swedes, stage. Both Swedes and a lot of a lot of the Nordic people speak English with a very in a very fluent manner. I've just got to say before we go, I have you seen what because this burst they not a new band, but have you seen photos of what they look like when they were signed to Relapse? No, they, they I would not know it's the same band. Honest to God, they look. They look so young, <laughs> like so. They look like children, <laughs> like because there's the guitarist with long hair, um, and the other guitarist looks like someone I know called Richard Howe, who who works for the BBC here in Suffolk. I mean, like really looks like him to the fact it was weirding me out when we saw them on stage. But yeah, the long haired mm-hmm. guitarist has got really short hair, and he he looks he looks about twelve years old. It's obviously that so- that Nordic living in sunlight, but. Are you looking up pictures of them now? I'm looking up pictures of them now, yeah. Oh, we didn't expect it. Don't, don't look up. No. I was going to make a joke, dirty joke, but no. <laughs> I don't dislike, I really love this band called Prolapse, and when the internet first came along, I soon found out an image search was a mistake. Right, let's go on to the first of our choices. Anyone who's not listened to this show before, we get four choices each, and we can play 30 seconds of anyone and the 30 seconds is so that we don't get done for licensing um and we the reason <laughs> no the reason there's there's four tracks each is the software you're using which is called zencaster you get 10 slots for things you can drop in so 
riff of the week for each and god why am i explaining this in painful detail it's not going to enhance the enjoyment of anything <laughs> right your first choice i'm going to play it and then i'm going to ask you to tell us what it is too much violence i don't want more down there out on the streets i can see the air i can see the heat no no more no more bad town no more bad town no no more no bad town no more bad town no more bad town What was that, Sam? That was Operation Ivy, uh, or Op Ivy, with Bad Town. Uh, it's the now uh, legendary band who sort of, maybe, I don't know if they did, but I, in my head they did, invent the, I think it's called the Third Wave of Scar Punk or something like that, and um, or the Second Wave, and they were late 80s, Californian band, uh, Berkeley, uh, same scene as Green Day, and the guitarist and the main singer on that track is Tim Armstrong, who is the frontman of Rancid, and um, it's not actually a track I ever liked that much, but my friend, uh, when I discovered them when I was 14, my friend Toby was the track that he attached himself to, and so Thinking of Toby, it's what I wanted to hear today because he's gone. Um, he's not with us anymore. And it is a song he loves because I think he was a moody teenager in a town he didn't like. And I think that's a song that speaks to all moody teenagers in towns they don't like. I love that. It's kind of a really straightforward reasoning. I was really surprised by this because, I mean, my my punk license uh, should have been revoked many years ago. But I know Operation Ivy from the T-shirts. <laughs> like you still to this day see a lot of people at gigs in Operation Ivy T-shirts, and because yeah, I, I knew, come. Yeah. I think the, the I think the the record stands up, but you know, that it, ship production. It's one of those ones that you can listen through the ship production of. Yeah, I don't think it's too bad, but Scar. Scar doesn't suffer from thin production in a way that something like doom metal would. You know, thin doom metal is just kind of pointless. It just sounds like. Yeah somebody trying to repair a washing machine in a distant oh, apartment yeah. and also shout out to matt freeman who's the bassist both in rancid and operation ivy and probably the man who made me want to play bass most of all He's... possibly the only thing i like about rancid is the bass play <laughs> i can't abide tim armstrong's vocals oh no it's sort of it's so easy to be so rude about it but it's basically it's basically like this american version of Joe Strummer without the intelligence. Is that nice? Oh, shit. No, I can see. No, I can see that. That kind of. Yeah, I'm not a fan of the, the human being. Oh, Joe, um, um, oh, crapping hell. They've got that to a point. Strummer, I used, I, I, but... I, let me. I, I I used to love love Rancid, um, but they got to a point where they just at least the two front people of Matt Fre- not Matt Freeman, Lars Fredrickson and Tim Armstrong just seemed to become at a certain point caricatures of themselves. Mm. And they did this thing of like their first four albums were so different from one another. And they would, the five, first five albums were so different from one another. And then they sort of ran out of like places to go with it. And they just sort of reverted back to trying to reclaim their glory days of mid 90s ska punk stuff. Uh, I think the, the, the second or stuff. third episode we did was about that very topic. So if you want to hear more <laughs> Sam slightly demolishing Rancid, go back and find that episode. Oh yeah, I forgot. I, I, I won't go on about them. Please, let's 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 it's okay. not, if you want to listen to Operation Ivy, don't listen to that track particularly. There are much better ones. But that one means a lot to me emotionally. Okay, so the next track, um when Sam and I first met many, many years ago, I don't think either of us particularly liked Scar. I certainly didn't like Scar. Scar was sort of I saw it as Oh, I just don't know why anyone would have liked it until I went to a Scar gig and just went, oh, I get it. It's brilliant. It's fun. This is cool. There's there's a lot of quite fun cliches around Scar, um, whereas the cliches around some other genres are not so much fun. But yeah, the, the, the Scar cliches kind of just think it's quite endearing now. But because Sam and I don't have an incredibly wide Scar vocabulary, 
we had to sort of divvy up some of the bands and uh, this is the this is a band that that Sam gave me I'm going to play it and then I'm going to tell you what it is <laughs> This is the first episode we've done, and, and uh, dear listeners, Sam and I can see each other. You know, the system we use allows us to see each other. First one we've done when we were all dancing to each of the tracks. <laughs> it's really fun. But, but that, also... that's... Oh, God, let me tell you who it is. That's King Prawn yeah. with People Taking Over. And it's also the second ska band we've featured, where it doesn't really sound that scarish. So more I deliberately like chose for mine. Common bass moment. I deliberately chose bits that, that didn't sound typically like ska, because I thought if anyone's going to look these bands up, They'll find all the Scar stuff. But for me, part of the, the thing I like about some parts of Scar is how unscar it is, which is a really odd thing to say. But King Prawn, this is from Surrender to Blender. And I'm not down on the discography, but is that the the last proper pink King Prawn album? Uh, or is it like the big one they had? It's the one I remember anyway. But I can remember... Another bounty. Oh, well, you look that up. I'm um, looking that up. And I'll so tell you why I chose that. I can't. No, they, the the last one they did was got the first, um, and then they put out a new one in two thousand nineteen. And uh, but got what the year first. So into Blender then? It's two thousand. Uh, oh, but it's man. like yeah, uh, they got it. You know, they started to get. I think they were always like very popular band but they record they never got as big as they wanted to be they i think they felt a bit left out of the mid 90s uh um sort of london or at least mid 90s sort of uh brit rock sort of because they were on the cusp of that but also on the cusp of the punk scene as well they were sort of in the middle of they everything con- they never considered that so they they were fairly close to the the dreaded b word the brit pop well, Brit yeah. rock, really, like Terror Vision and, you know, they have ah. aspects of that and that sort of underground. Uh, but they, they, that Serenity to the Blender album was great. Um, but they, I think it was, I heard things about the reason, one of the reasons they set up is because they just, they were just, they hit a glass ceiling and just could not get beyond it. And it wasn't, just, it just became unsustainable. Uh, you know, in many ways, in some ways. I've, I've heard other things that I'm not going to discuss in this podcast. <laughs> Their manager lives about 100 yards from my house, uh, a guy called Simon, who's who's a very cool guy. Uh, I, I chose that because I, when I first heard the album start to finish, it absolutely blew me away. It's so creative. It's got so many bits in it, and it's so nicely recorded. And there's funny little orchestral bits. There's It's got an intro track, and it's got... That's I think that's Barbara Luck singing on that one, who's the bassist, who I've booked a couple of times to play here in Ipswich and is always kind of very entertaining. Um, and it, I also chose that because the guitar playing in, in King Prawn, I just absolutely love. There's just something so brilliant about it. It's quite kind of rock, but also sort of psychedelic. You know, that wah-wah bit there. I just... What a great band. One way worth looking up. And I think it's one of those bands that will challenge conception, preconceptions about Scar. Big yeah, problem. and uh, uh, Al uh, Rumjen, uh, Rumjen, Rumjen? Um, the singer, he went, he worked for, he went off and did, in front of the album with Asian Dub Foundation. Mm. And their, their thing for a bit, when I remember the, like thinking about it, their thing for a bit was like, yeah, we're very, they were sort of like, we're very East London, basically. Is they're all. I don't think any of them. I don't know if any of them were necessarily uh, so-called white British, um, but they were very much sort of like the punk scenes ours as well. Fuck you guys, which I always thought was an incredibly cool thing to do. And they were also so creative. Every, their original sort of stuff was so like, yeah, you had this guitarist who occasionally would break out into like a metal riff or something like that. Uh, the bass lines, I love the bass lines because they were there's a beauty in their simplicity 
Um, proper, proper dubby stuff as well, isn't yeah. it? Really yeah. deep, just gentle. He, he's a he's a fun person to speak to. <laughs> Papa Lung. <laughs> right, let's go on for the next one. So the next choice is yours, and it's a band I'd never heard of. So I will play it, then you can tell us what it is. Chosen for this bass bit. Sorry, when I say I chose it, I mean, when Sam tells me what songs he wants, and, and if he doesn't give me timestamps, I have to pick a 30 second from the middle. But who was that, Sam? That was the Gadgets with Traffic uh, Tickets. They are, they were, I think, um, in late 90s band signed to Hellcat Records, which was, which is, was, I don't know if it's that active anymore, but was very active in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's by run by Tim Armstrong. Or at least owned by Tim Armstrong, and probably fan that's by him. Um, and uh, that was a their first album. I, so good. It's this mixture of sort of sixties, sixties uh, sort of melodies, but with a ska punk backing to it. And I think they were just like late teenagers when they recorded it. And it's just one of those albums. I you know basically we said we don't. I don't like Spar Punk very much anymore. Um, it, I just feel like I've, it's not who I am anymore. Have you enjoyed uh, listening to tracks in pre- preparation for this, though? Very much so, but it, yeah. <laughs> I have no interest, no interest in finding new Spar Punk bands. But I love it, sort of um, being able to choose like the one-off tracks has been a really enjoyable experience. And um, that gadget, is, that gadgets album, the first one, um, I have to look it up. Uh, cracking bit of bass playing again i mean it is it is a really strong strong thing in scar i was yeah. surprised again I've, I've never heard of that band but i was quite surprised yeah it's, it's sort of 60s garage pop done with scar isn't there there's something very yeah. charming about it quite quite always it, kind of quite innocent sounding yeah it is it is um and they do it really well and it's really nice like keyboard playing in it as well it's called at ease um and it was sort of the second album they did. They went a bit. Ex- they tried to go a bit experimental, and it's not as like I think not as straightforward, and therefore loses something, frankly. Whereas that is just an album of great pop songs played in a ska punk manner, and um, yeah, it's such. I, I that's one of those albums uh, I used to consider as one of the the best, you know, examples of the genre, and. Uh, one of those ones I didn't like to take off the CD, take off the CD player when it was in the CD player, because we're talking about back in the nineties, so mm. there were CD players involved rather than just streaming. I didn't want to piss off Metallica that much. So, <laughs> um, before we go any further forward, uh, there's going to be a few notable exceptions here, and they're bands I do want to talk about. Um, and one of the exceptions that that we I'm not giving anything away, but neither of us have chosen. There's a band called Once Over from Brighton. Yeah. And one, sure. Once Over were, well, they were absolutely ska punk. How many of them were there? There was a, seven or eight, I don't know. They only oh. just seemed to fit in the transit band they turned up in uh, when we put them on. But they yeah. they really personified the, the fun and just the just the kind of all-out craziness of ska punk in the, in the mid-2000s. Fronted yeah. by a guy called Ed, who uh, last time we put them on was encouraging people to pour vodka in their eyes, um, wow. which sounds an odd, but everyone seemed up for it. I wasn't. Hey, it, but... was, it was it was the cool thing at the time, um, <laughs> as was the style at the time. I remember, I remember they 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 were Brighton locals, or they were Little Hampton, LA locals, because you don't say Little Hampton, you say Little Hampton. Um, Little Hampton. Yeah, and they were. Um, sort of local to the Brighton scheme, scheme uh, scene, and they're really lovely guys. And um, always, the you know, I put them on just because they were fun to be to see, and all, they had a party on stage. And I remember one tour they started the first, or the first when they started touring, 
They did the first gig in Brighton and it was shit. And by the time they came back a month later, they were incredible. And like all the pieces had just come into place and they had just matured into this amazing band. And it was, and they did that sort of thing of like, yeah, it was ska punk, but there was also like, they did death metal vocals and then they did, uh, you know, beat down moments and they had a lot of fun with it. And um, yeah, they were, they were a lot, they were good. They were very good. They never recorded that well, I don't think. And that was one of their, da- the, one of the shames. They, they were this magical mix because I put them on a lot in Ipswich and they used to sort of come to Ipswich midpoint in tours because they, the pub we were using at the moment at the time was called the Steamboat and Val, who was the landlady there, would let them sleep in the pub and she'd send them off with, with packed lunches because she'd like, <laughs> she'd like worried they weren't eating properly. So she'd give, she'd, give, properly. she'd make them like sandwich, literally a packed lunch, but she'd put them just on plates uh, with cling film over the top. And it didn't matter how long it was. They're almost in tears the first time she did it. It doesn't matter how long it was between between gigs in Ipswich. They'd always bring the plates back, <laughs> which I always thought was just adorable. Which is what like a really nice thing to do. Here's your plates now. And in the end, they they were bringing her gifts, and they um they turned up one year, and each one of them had chosen a different pot plant for Val. So <laughs> like <laughs> when she lived above the pub, they're like, yeah, we, we've seen we see that stage. We think you, you need more pot plants, but what I was going to say is they had this brilliant, they knew how to walk the line from being like kind of crazy and party animals, but not being a pain in the ass and not being difficult to work with and yeah. not causing any damage. So they, they'd be really full on. And to give you an idea of the, you know, the stage experience, um, they'd use wireless packs. Obviously they're a big loud band. And normally, <laughs> normally when, when people use wireless packs with brass instruments, you have like a little microphone that clips on the end of the horn part. And then there's like a long lead that goes down and it goes into like a, a, a thing about the size of a pack of cigarettes that goes in your back pocket. I mean, like trumpet player in, in, in my band, these are end times. That's, that's how he does it. They, they didn't do that. They'd have the microphone at the end of the horn and then they just gaffer tape the, the transmitter to the side of the horn. I mean, like, normally when you see brass instruments, they're really shiny and like really nice. These things look like, bombs they look like like improvised explosive devices it was amazing and of course they are also part of our story um that the the story that brought us together oh did you come down and in, 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 when you're in playing pissed resistance then with once over to, to, oh yeah, to yeah. Uh, yeah but also it was more like um we were when we when we first uh started hanging out in that punk scene and you suggested to all the people in punk news, uh, oh, and some of us said, oh, shit, yeah, that sounds cool, to go to a zine fest in Essen in Germany. Is it Essen? No, it was uh, Mulheim. Oh, Mulheim. Yeah, I thought it was Mulheim. You know, basically uh, m- middle of nowhere in Germany. Jeez. And we, and oh, once over, and uh, they were touring in the UK with a German band called Schonderschwalk, which, which means um, special school. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they seemed really nice. So I'd gone to see them with Aunt Soap and Bryce and they seemed nice guys. And then we got to um we got to Ipswich and not uh, and they were playing that night, but the night before mm. we went yeah, to the I, put, I put them on. Yeah, I put them on the yeah. night before we, we flew out. And they were saying we were saying, Oh, we're flying out to Germany tomorrow and they said or well, someone in our group, I think maybe Alice was saying, oh, we're flying out to Germany tomorrow. And they said, well, where are you staying? And we said, oh, we just thought we'd squat in the squat. And they went, hold on, hold on, hold on. Our bassist lives in that town. Mm-hmm. He'll give you his flat. And the bassist came along and gave us, and he was like, are you joking? He was on his phone. He was, on his he was, phone very, he was his, very drunk. <laughs> he was very drunk. He was on his phone to his uh, his partner, partner and sort of going, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. These these people, these random people, I've just I've just met. I'm going to stay in uh, my place tomorrow. Um, if you just leave them leave them some pasta, they'll be fine. Mm. And um, it was like, wow, that's the to me that was like the epitome of like how cool the punk scene could be. Yeah, I've just like... met you guys, but you're cool because you're friends with a band that we're uh, touring with, and they're cool, and therefore you can stay in my flat and don't worry about it. That's such like, a lovely snapshot of, of, of that scene at that time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's never changed. We we just not as active, but yeah, and we did. We we didn't want to stay in the squat that the Zine Fest was happening in because it was all right, but it was just like here's some 
manky looking mattresses. It was in a bus depot, <laughs> literally some mattresses on the floor of a bus depot. So we, we wandered that, around. We're, we're not that on Narco. <laughs> we're not that we're not on no. So we, we wandered around for a bit. And then we did find the, this guy's apartment. We turned up, and his girlfriend had cooked us dinner. It was yeah. it was absolutely incredible. We were so pleased that when we left, we all left gifts for them. I left some teeth, some beat motel t shirts, and a load of zines. And the other thing I remember about that trip is it's the first time I'd seen one of those German toilets where you stand up and you can see what you've done. Uh... So instead of <laughs> instead of your leavings going down a hole like it does in the UK, it just was on a little platform. And it was it was quite shocking. So anyway, that that. that <laughs> That that that's kind of we need to wrap that up because it was a cool thing. But yeah, thanks for raising that, Sam, because that's a that's a lovely little vignette of how cool the punk scene was. Right, let's go for another track. So you just had the gadgets, which incidentally is spelled G A D J I T S. And check out the show notes because every every episode we always list what we've played and what our riff of the week was and and all that stuff. Uh, Sam has wandered off, but. I think he's using Bluetooth Bluetooth headphones. So he probably I, I am using Bluetooth headphones. There he is. Look, he's come back. Right. So my song. Now this one is one of those that it's so painful to stop after thirty seconds. So I pushed it to about thirty-two because I'm friends of friends with the guy with this band, and it's another band I used to put on in Ipswich. And I'm just going to play it. Here we go. Help me. In. Don't assume I'm in Oh, I'll terrorise ya I'll fucking terrorise ya Remember me Don't forget me And even brother I won't let ya You know I'm weak You know I'm weak You take a Oh God! It's it, I hate the fact I had to cut that off. Do you know who that was, Sam? No, no. Who's that? It was a band from South End called The Big. Oh and yeah. I'm gonna have to rein myself in because I am a fanboy of this band. I was given this album by Ed Ed Rome, the singer, who's just a, a God, one of the nicest people I think I've ever met, and. This album, it's the second big album, it was released on Moonscar, it's called Whatever Makes You Happy, and it came with two discs, and I may have mentioned this on the podcast before, but the first disc is a Scar album, it's absolutely a Scar album, and they were another bloody fantastic live band, brass and everything, and the, the Ed, the singer, was an amazing guitarist, and he's, I really didn't want to mention this, but he's a really big bloke, like really tall, so he made a strap that he played look really small, but he was he was just such such a brilliant singer. And God, I love his voice. Anyway, so the second disc on this album was all the same songs that were on the first disc, but all done in different styles. So that one is I don't even know what what to call that style of music. But there's like proper like old blues style. There's psychedelic. There's it's quite just a genius thing. And I'm going to include a link to the album because it's now available on Bandcamp, so you can go and buy it, and I'm, I'm absolutely going to buy this, because I just think it's it's genius. See, I'm, I'm, I'm running, I'm going to just dive into superlatives now, but it's, again, that creativity. For Scar, which is a scene that the preconception might be that the music follows very strict rules, I think even just with the selections we've chosen so far today, Sam, that we've kind of disproved that. Yeah, I think I think I was like playing with choices, uh, and you know, I was thinking even like I really liked at one point I really liked Real Big Fish, who were a massive band in the mid. God, they got uh, huge. They were, I saw them at V Festival. Yeah, and um, even back then they sort of toyed with big metal like sound guitar sounds and stuff like that, and the guitarist was really enamored with like. Yeah, rock and roll, uh, doing rock and roll stuff in the in, in in the so yeah, the scene isn't as sort of like one dimensional as sometimes you one isn't what as one dimensional as sometimes you think it might be. Absolutely, I mean, one of the things that I've I've told myself I wouldn't do with this podcast is beg the listener to go and listen to things, but honestly, please just listen to to that that big album. 
the the first and the spot obviously on the band camp it just runs from one to the next but it's i'd take that with me to the moon this album i'm it's been it's been an absolute joy rediscovering some of these things but i am going to stop going on about it i'm going to hopefully interview ed the singer on on this podcast he's re- <laughs> he's released an album as a homage to 1970s and 80s british rail diesel engines which is it's electronica and it's brilliant it's so good i, I, I interviewed him for for beat motel a long time ago and, and actually i will include a link to the interview on on, on the show notes Let's make a note of this include link to ed interview yeah, i interviewed him for beat motel back when uh, he used to just go and sit with a dictaphone and, and interview people and we talked about trains quite a lot as well but i'll include a link to the ed to, to the interview just anyway that's the big i need to think just draw a line under that otherwise i'll, I'll get too excited you got anything more to add no sounded interesting yeah it's cool i bloody love it as you can probably tell uh, right next song is now we didn't divvy this one up but when i saw you chose this i thought it was good that you chose this band because there's only a few songs i know and it would have been their like biggest song that everybody knows so oh. I, i'm gonna play it i'm gonna play it and then we'll talk about it <laughs> for it sam cat down uh yes a, a an a political stand of reasons um is the song title and they were like there was a weird sort of thing of king thorn standing a bit away from the punk scene and cat down very much stood in the punk scene and were sort of at least in brighton terms seemed to be the kings of the uk punk scene for a good few years and they used to play. I saw. I saw. It was like we, there was a venue in Brighton that had four hundred people. Uh, so it was about four hundred people, maybe. Uh, Concord Two and bands like mm. Against Me have played there. I've seen Tropic Murphys there and a few other bands, Sigvall and you know and Melvins have played there and all these sort of. If they go to Brighton, that's sort of a pretty good mid-sized venue for Brighton. And they were a UK underground punk band that wasn't featured in the magazines that used to sell that place out and it. Just when I was a late teen, that just seemed like the coolest thing um, because it wasn't people waiting for the American bands to come over here. It was actually homegrown that people were being, going crazy over. And their second album seemed to usher in this sort of, and, um, particularly with the household name scene, seemed to usher in this sort this of... Is it house, album, sorry, household name records. Yeah. Household name records, yeah. That seemed to usher in this sort of like this battle of creativity which went from Cat Down's second album and sort of ended with the last Lightyear album. Um, and this, these people just sort of all of a sudden like unlocked a key of how to mix genres very fluidly. Like they didn't, you weren't jumping from metal to hardcore or you weren't jumping from ska to, you know, sort of metal. They were actually melded within the sound. You could hear the hardcore beat within the, 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 ska, the ska punk. Uh, guitar stuff, and I just, I just love that second album. It was seemed to be in my head so important. Um, it, it, they're a remarkable scene. band. You know, we we've talked on here before about Punk News now, which is, this is punknews.co.uk, which is was um, where Sam and I and God, still a lot of people I'm friends with now met before we kind of just fucked it into a cocked hat and <laughs> it died. But. Um, they, they, you know, guys in Cap Down were on the on the forum. You know, you say sort of they're part of the scene. They really, really were. They, they weren't, they weren't distant from it at all. They, they, they just seemed like cool. I can't remember the guy's name. Was it something? What was the guy's name? Was it Bunhead or something? Or Boobies? Or <laughs> it wasn't. It was some name that I was always thought was really funny that people called him that. I didn't realize there was a guy in Cap Town on the forum. 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, mean, I could be wrong. It's a long time ago. But yeah, Scar Wars is the other track. That's the one that, that always gets chosen whenever somebody talks about Cap Down, which is, there, it gets played on Six Music quite often now as well. Which there was, uh, there, I don't know if they're still around. I don't know, I think they're still around, but there was a t shirt that used to be sold in Brighton, which used the Star Wars font, and it was Scar Wars. Oh, and yeah. Went through a phase of seeing that at all the gigs. It's like mandatory. Yeah, yeah. We can't. The we band can't play yet. No one's got a Star Wars T-shirt on. <laughs> I I saw them. I miss, completely missed out because they, when they were playing around this part of the world, they always used to play Colchester or Cambridge. In fact, the video for Star Wars was filmed at Cambridge Junction, which is a tiny little venue. So I never, I never actually saw them properly. The only time I sort of saw them was at Reading Festival, and they'd just they'd signed to a major. I can't remember who they signed to. And that always causes a bit of consternation in the in the scene. But I want to see against me at Reading, and they're playing one of the tents. So did what I always do at festivals. You turn up at the end of the band before to sort of you know make sure you're in the right place because not everything runs damn to schedule, especially not at Reading. And we got there, and you couldn't get within 100 yards of the tent. You couldn't get anywhere near it. It was packed, and it's because Capdown were playing. And there was a moment where it looked like they were not just going to be as big as Real Big Fish or as big as you know any of those kind of bands. It looked like they were going to be as big as you know Blur or something. There was so much excitement around them, so much hype, and I don't really know what happened. I don't know. They 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 did a lost. They did a they put out a few singles. They signed to a record label called Fierce Panda. They did a few singles. In the early two thousands, and they put out an album in two thousand seven, and by that point, it was just it had changed. Just the scene had the interest had gone, the momentum had gone, and yeah, I don't I don't know what happened to them internally. Um, it's it's that second album, particularly the second album, just sort of stands out as this incredible uh, creative high point of the British punk scene of the late nineties and early two thousands to me. Why did I think that they signed to a major? Is Fierce Panda... I wouldn't have thought Fierce Panda as a major. No. Are they? I don't think so. <laughs> Just looked look them up on... Um, it was really bugging me that I couldn't remember their names. And so I've looked them up on... Looked them up on Wikipedia. And I wasn't wrong. So there's Fierce. Andrew. Go on. Fierce Panda... Uh... Uh, also produced a small number of releases uh, in 1994 by now famous acts such as Ash, The Blue Tones, Baby Bird, and Supergross. Why did I? Or did, I thought at the time that they signed to a major and didn't put anything out. I'm, I'm clearly just misremembering. But they also credit, they're also credited re- releases with uh, Death Cab for Cutie, uh, Art Brute. Uh, Placebo, the Polyphonic Spree, oh, bloody hell, <laughs> wow. Embrace, Coldplay. So b- uh, big, big label, not major. God, not the, only major, this would matter on on a podcast with a punk background. Important, uh, important indie label. Just noticed how how long, hang on, yeah, how many years they were between the releases. So. Albums, Civil Disobedience came out on Household Name Records. And Household Name, if you've not heard of them, were are just a huge part of the UK scene. They had a record shop and just loads. They of have pages. a record shop. They have a record All shop. All ages in London still going. They did just. They just loads of cool stuff. They they he went through a short phase of putting together super groups, which um, I might discuss when we play one of the bands later on. So Civil Disobedience was two thousand pound for the sound was two thousand and one. And then the Fierce Panda album, Wind Up Toys, was six years later. That's a huge gap. For you know, they only did three albums, and one of them was that long later. Anyway, it, oh, I'm going to put their Wikipedia link on the. Um, I'm going to put their Wikipedia link in the show notes because it's actually really interesting reading. Let me just make a note of that now. So, cap down wiki. Right. Uh, right, so band names. Let's, we need to move on. So I'm just going to tell you the ba- name of the band members. Andrew Eddie Hunt, Tim McDonald, Keith Minter, Jake Sims Fielding, and then Boob. 
I knew it was something like that. Well, his name's Robin Boob Gould. I just remember people talking about boob. I don't know what he did, but... Do you think they were talking about boobs? <laughs> I don't I don't know. Um, anyway, we, we, need, we need to move on because, uh, you know, this is fun. Oh, it's one of my choices. Now this, I'm going to play it. Did I click it properly? <gasps> play it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to play another one just to see if I've broken it. Oh, no, that one works. Ah. Oh. oh, it gives a minute. I'm going to be a bit cavalier here. I'm going to try and import it again. I must have ballsed it up. Did I? Hang on. Just can you uh, fill for me, Sam? So, what can I see from the window? I can see the uh, salmon pink painted flat block, some taller flat blocks, roofs. Oh, that roof needs a bit of TLC. Yeah. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, so, yes, I don't... It, I'm not it's not, it's not going to work. I'm just trying to re-import it. It was Citizen Fish, so I'll just have to talk about Citizen Fish. I chose Citizen Fish because I bloody love the Subhumans, and Citizen Fish was you know, the other band of, of Dick from the Subhumans. Only gig I've ever been challenged to a fight at was oh. Citizen Fish. I was at the Steamboat, and I was having a wee at the Urinals, and I was sort of vaguely aware of this is while the band were playing and the, and the toilets used to be right next to where the bands played. So it was loud in the toilets. And I was vaguely aware this guy was leaning over and saying something. But, you know, I don't tend to engage in conversation at the toilets. And I came out and this bloke made a beeline for me. This somebody else. And he said, you're a bit tough, aren't you? And I was like, what? And he said, well, he was he was challenging you to a fight. And I was like, I was having a wee. I still don't know what it was all about, but... Yeah, no idea. And I also remember that gig at the Steamboat. The bassist had a huge jumper on. Like, he was a man in his 50s, I'd say, but his jumper was just huge. It went right down to his knees. They were very much like subhumans. Uh, Citizen Fish very much hand-in-hand hand with the anarcho scene. I mean, like the proper, you know, oh, I kind of sometimes think of as squatter punks or travelling travellers punks, um, both of which... Scenes created some incredible music, but anyway, that was Sits and Fish, and it was off a split record, a split EP they did with Leftover Crack, uh. um, which I thought was was a hell of a mix because oh God, Leftover Crack, we'd probably do a an episode on that type of band <laughs> and have plenty to say. But no, yeah, sorry, you don't get to hear Sits and Fish because I don't know why. But let's go on to your last choice. <laughs> You know how we said that drummers in black metal bands ought to get paid twice as much as the, the rest of the band just for the amount of effort they have to make? I think the same goes with bassists and ska bands. <laughs> he was chucking down many more notes than anyone else there. Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a uh, busy boy. So who was um, that? That was Streetlight Manifesto with, uh, what's the song title? Here's, Here's to Life. Life. And uh, they were the, probably the last ska punk band that I got into. And I only really liked the first album. They released two more. They were weirdly signed to Vitri Records, who mm. are much more known for their meathead uh, hardcore. Uh, so Vitri Records, one owned by Dexter from Offspring. No, that is Nitro Records. Ah, oh god, no, I remember Victory. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And they got like a bulldog logo and they seem to be very i don't know there was always sort of like oh i'm not sure it always felt like it was a money making scheme to try and get money out of the you know the little money that floats around the punk rock scene i always felt i was gonna say all that millions of pounds floating around yeah. the punk scene <laughs> but you know it, like it was i think there was money floating around it in the late 90s and early 2000s but 
you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, that was said without any, uh, 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 you know, and they, you know, uh, Street uh, Street Art Manifesto. I think they they still tour America at least. They still tour, but they do not record anymore because they fell out so harshly with Victory. He refuses to, I think. Um, release them from their contract it's got really, really really shitty and there's a whole sort of i'm sure the wikipedia site it details it i haven't looked at but that album uh and also i don't remember the uh, was it um street like uh the singer was also from the band uh how'd you spell that <laughs> Cash twenty two. Oh, um, really? Yeah, and they to the extent that he re record they re recorded. Oh, so Street on the I recorded five albums. They re recorded uh, the Catch twenty two first album, um, and um, yeah. So the first album by Catch twenty two is called uh, Keys Be Nights, and the second album by um, Streetline Manifesto is called Keys Be Nights, and they have the same albums re recorded. Um, one uh, because the singer songwriter um, went on to form Streetline Manifesto after he fell out with, I guess, the Catch 22 chaps. And um, they sort of, I don't know, they sort of, I got a bit sad about them uh, because the music never, the, the subsequent albums never lived up to what I thought the first few albums, the first album was so good for, which was sort of a marrying of ska punk, again, with sort of piece of, the, the, the musicians on Streetline Manifesto albums are fantastic. And they sort of, the horns did this thing where they, they sort of bought in, I don't know, they, they had like an epicness to them, which this sounds, might sound ridiculous, but there's something of the, Klezmer slash Eastern European uh, uh, scales that they're using for the horn to- for the the horn lines, and it it just brings out a whole different whole like. But they're not playing it at all in like a klezmer style. They're playing it in a ska punk style, and it just brings out this whole sort of romantic sound to it. Go to go back to like the. Um, uh, again. Yeah, I'm reading a book about the first rutting. movement of, of, of <laughs> I'm always reading a book about rutting, but this is an academic <laughs> book about uh it's not an academic, it's a history book about German romantics and Rachmaninoff, I think was is called a romantic composer because of like these big lush movements of sort of uh the music sounds romantic, it sounds poetic, it sounds big and sort of like and and so do the horn lines of Street Manifesto, like Manifesto, and they seem to take from the same scales. I knew the name uh, just because you know I did zines and have been around music for so long, but I'd never really listened to them. I didn't even know they were a ska band. I just I don't know. There's something about the name Street like Manifesto that I thought they'd be hardcore, but <laughs> I think a, a lot of um, ska is so is so tight and kind of clipped and so squeezed into a box that yeah hearing horns like that suddenly everything becomes huge yeah i'm going to mention another band who are conspicuous by their absence and i i did want to include them i probably fucking could have done if i'd got if i just dropped citizen fish um is the slackers who yeah i never seen live but they went through a phase they did boss harmony sessions they did about three possibly four albums in a row and i absolutely loved every single one of them every song off every one of them because they they sort of were a bit more traditional, a bit more sort of on, on that reggae side of. Yeah, of that's ska. why I didn't. That's why I didn't include them because of that. The, you know, they weren't ska. I, I consider them a ska band, not ska punk band. You see, mm. darling. But yeah, <laughs> but there was a point. I agree with you. There was a point where everything they did seemed to be just so well done, so well done, and so the music, the, the songwriting was fantastic, and the. Everything was good about it. Everything was great about it. I, I love the production. They they 
they did an album, the Boss Harmony Sessions, and I've got a horrible feeling Boss Harmony is a reggae producer. I'm, I'm, I'm horribly ignorant about things like this. But they managed to get the production to sound exactly like late 60s Jamaican ska bands did. And in fact, that, that album by The Big, there's an alternative, or possibly a couple of the tracks on the second disc of that, where they do the same thing. And they've just... they've. It's not like when metal sounds thin, but it's it's such a specific sound. I could I could probably pick out a Jamaican recording studio sound from the late sixties in almost any in almost anything. I don't know if it was the the equipment was terrible or I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just going to be guessing. Don't go much further than that. So yeah, that that was the slackers. I just want to give them an honourable mention. I'm going to go on to the last track. Here we go. <laughs> A bit of singing, really, shouldn't I? Now, I, that's uh, Inner Terrestrials with War. I deliberately chose that, <laughs> despite the fact it had no singing, because that little shift at the end where they slow down, Inner Terrestrials, another band that I've put, personally put on a bunch of times here in Ipswich, um, at the time I was putting them on, very much part of the Traveller community, and the guy, oh shit, I can't remember his name. The singer's voice, Jake, Jay. Oh God. Anyway, I can. I, he's another voice I love. Him and the big Ed from the big. Just two voices. That just here on anything, and I think sound brilliant. But live, the Interestials were sort of half hardcore, half ska punk, but always really, really interesting. And they had this amazing ability to to flip. Uh, flip a switch halfway through a song and go from hardcore to, to Scar in a way that kind of made sense and I don't think it's terribly easy to do. Did you ever see any terrestrials? Yes. Uh, you, I, I went oh, you, you saw them here, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> and something really didn't click with me and I just thought it was terrible. No, that was a weird gig. It was in a place called the Drum Monkey which has since been demolished and it was... I can't mention any of the names of the people who were involved with that. <laughs> it wasn't a great gig. Something really wound me up about it. I remember because my wife, well, Emma came as well, didn't she? My wife. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, love the interrestrials. And I was like, this environment does not suit this <laughs> at all. <laughs> oh, shit. I completely forgot you saw them, but I like them. And I've not heard the latest album, but the one before that, Tales of Terror, still good. They're still doing something interesting, still doing something cool. Um, God, we are out of time, Sam. Do you yeah. want to give us a. Give us a, a little wrap up. Give us thirty uh, seconds. Do, uh, do you want wrong. me to pick it, pick it up? Pick it up. Pick it up. Yeah, it's a Scar Punk joke. Uh, Scar <laughs> Punk's fun. It's more creative than we sometimes think it is, and uh, it doesn't. It's a, just the music that doesn't really speak to me much anymore. I, but it's a lot of fun to listen to. And if you find an excuse to listen to it, it's very good. But I don't have the energy for it. I'm too old for it. <laughs> What a great conclusion. Yeah, I've enjoyed listening to two tracks, but I don't have the energy to skank all night like some sort of young person. It's, it's funny. It's like drinking like loads of coffee and then sitting down and watching a very slow documentary. I think we put Scarpunk on. You're like, I need to do something with this energy. <laughs> it needs to sort of match where I am. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think well, one of the it. last pits, I, the last smosh pits I was in was actually Streetlight Manifesto. Um, and it's because I just, because they had that sort of infectious energy it was down Camden Underworld and I just couldn't help myself just wanted to get involved uh, and so we both happened in well over 10 years you're saying we're both lacking the excess energy now now we need to con- con- you know, need to hold on to the energy we have got yes yes <laughs> okay on that note we're actually coming in at under the hour where so we've done well so until god we've got so many episodes coming up so many brilliant things until the next time i'm gonna say goodbye do you want to say goodbye sam and goodbye goodbye